So good evening and welcome to everyone who is participating on Zoom and everyone live at Temple Israel. My name is Bob Smolin. I'm the Adult Education Chair at Temple Israel. Um, I'm in sunny Southern Florida at the moment, but Tikva's in Uganda, so we have a wide, diverse audience in geographic terms. And we're delighted everyone is here and uh, recording. I must give you the uh, fair warning or a fair statement that uh, all the comments, opinions, and cartoons that Jimmy is showing tonight are not uh, representative of Temple Israel, but more of Jimmy and his work over the past 30 years. Um, let me introduce Jimmy and make sure that he's with us here. And uh, I wanted to uh, share that uh, Jimmy, of course, has been doing this for 30 years, which is a, an amazing career. Uh, Jimmy started out in 1973 as a graduate of Carnegie Mellon University with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Graphic Design, not a degree in cartooning, but uh, obviously the graphic arts has led him to a different career. He can get into the details of that if he'd like as we go forward. Jimmy's been a syndicated columnist amongst many newspapers throughout the country, um, in New York, New York Times, the Washington Post, USA Today, the LA Times, uh, Newsweek, Business Week, et cetera and his cartoons have been used all over. As we will use the print media, or we had the golden age of print media, I think that was a much more opportune situation today. Social media probably has taken the floor in electronic distribution of cartoons. But political cartoons do add to our society commentary in, sorry, in, in kind of satirical terms that really speak to the point, and they may be pointing to an individual or to a circumstance or to some situation that we really kind of giggle at when we take a look at or it reinforces what we're thinking. All of that being said, Jimmy has a tremendous amount. We're delighted that he's with us tonight. He's a mem member of Temple Israel for about the past 26 years. And we're very happy to have this special person, special talent within our congregation. So we're delighted to do that. And I want to welcome everyone. And I want to turn the screen over to Jimmy. And Jimmy, if you can unmute, I give you the screen and you can screen share whenever you're ready. The thing I wanted to mention to everyone is that if you have a question, there's a chat feature in Zoom. Please put your questions in chat and Craig Padover at the end of the program will be happy to feed the questions back to Jimmy. And then we may have some open time for everyone as we get near the end. So please feel free to do that and use the chat feature. So Jimmy, welcome, and the screen and microphone is yours. Uh, thank you, Bob, and look on share screen. Okay, um, I'm going through this, uh, all this technology. Okay, I think we're, we got it. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming tonight, and thank everyone for showing up on Zoom as well. And, um, First of all, I want to repeat about the questions, save your questions for the end, and I'll be glad to entertain them or comments or throwing things at me or however you want to express yourself after you've seen the cartoons. Um, I have a lot of cartoons because I am terrible at making decisions as to which ones to show and which ones to leave out. So I'm going to basically let the cartoons speak for themselves and uh, instead of giving a major introduction. So uh, first of all, I want to clarify uh, the number of 30 years, which has come up. I'm not sure how we arrived at that, but it's actually uh, closer to 50 since I started drawing cartoons, although not exactly making a living uh, all that time, but uh, I, I did start in the 70s when I was in college. Um, so uh, the, the first cartoon I am showing is one that uh, got an atypically uh, big um, response, and I'll show the cartoon and describe it. Okay, this is from uh, 2001 when The Sopranos was becoming a big pop culture hit. And at the time, three uh, public officials in New Jersey were uh, under scrutiny or, or involved in some kind of a scandal uh, uh, 
former Representative Bob Torricelli for taking uh, campaign gifts that he shouldn't have. Uh, then uh, acting governor Donald DeFrancesco was being investigated for conflicts of interest when he was township attorney in Scotch Plains. And Peter Venero was the attorney general who had been nominated to serve on the state Supreme Court. And he had been kind of cagey about uh, discussing racial profiling among state police on New Jersey highways. So I, I have, this is the, from the opening scene of The Sopranos, Tony Soprano uh, goes down to the end of his driveway to pick up the newspaper and says, it's guys like this who give Jersey a bad name. Now, um, this cartoon originally appeared on a Sunday in April uh, in the record where I was working at the time. And then because my cartoons also appear in some other New Jersey papers, uh, it appeared uh, later on in that week elsewhere, including the Asbury Park Press. Um, it happens that uh, around the same time that the cartoon first appeared, uh, Donald DeFrancesco, who was the acting governor once, once uh, Christy Whitman had been appointed to the Bush administration as the administrator of the EPA, he announced he was going to run for office to get to be governor on his own. Uh, a few days later, after the uh, cartoon ran, he held another press conference announcing that he was withdrawing from the race. And one of his reasons was because of the treatment he had gotten uh, at the hands of the media. And he held up this cartoon as the most egregious example of uh, mistreatment. Okay. Now, um, New Jersey has had a problem with uh, car theft, so uh, I decided to do a cartoon about that. To combat climate change, everyone must do their part. From now on, we only steal electric vehicles. Yeah, I tried that, it didn't work. I'll try it again. Okay, um, one of the big issues of the past year has been uh, the rise of artificial intelligence. So um, here's a couple of people uh, in the break room at work. I worry I'll be replaced by a robot. Hey, don't you worry. I do the worrying for you. Okay. Um, TikTok has been in the news a lot, and when it became uh, very popular, certain um, governments and other institutions decided that they wanted to ban it because it, it's owned by uh, China. So I have a couple of people reading an official notice. TikTok is banned due to a security issue with China, and one of the onlookers says, don't tell me China wants to steal our dance moves. Uh, there have been a number of instances with um, uh, African American motorists stopped by over aggressive policing. So here I have a scene at the uh, Dr. King Memorial in Washington, D.C., with a, a police officer saying, step out of the vehicle and show me your hands. Uh, I think including Ridgewood, a uh, number of schools have changed the starting times uh, after they discovered that teenagers don't take to getting up early in the morning. Somehow all of us managed to do it. I'm not sure what kind of evolution occurred where today's generation can't. But anyway, uh, so uh, uh, someone's looking at the uh, student notice that says about the later high school start time and says, 
So getting bullied begins at 8.30 instead of 7.50. I could have uh, done a whole program of cartoons on Trump, but here's one of several. We gave Stormy Daniels 130,000. How much to keep this lady quiet? My parents say our generation's falling behind in math and reading, says the generation failing history. Now, unfortunately, even before October 7th, there was a, a, a spike in anti-Semitism. And so I, this is from uh, earlier uh, last year, and I've done a number of them. Uh, there'll be more to come. If TikTok is blocked, then what am I going to do? Read a book? Didn't they ban those too? Um, last year, there were several instances of the homeowners who uh, kept a firearm at home who were overly concerned about uh, someone knocking on their door or some unfamiliar noise. So. Here are the guys saying, I heard a noise on the roof. Um, one of my major uh, issues of pride in this field is being on the enemies list of the National Rifle Association. Uh, about 20 years ago, uh, uh, then New York Times columnist Bob Herbert uh, broke the news that they did have an enemies list, which included people in different walks of life who had somehow spoken out in favor of sensible gun control. And I learned that I was one of 14 cartoonists who were on that list. So I think this may have been the cartoon that did that. This ran in the New, in the New York Times in 1999 after uh, the Columbine massacre. And, and the Columbine massacre actually occurred after there were a series of other uh, similar mass shootings at, at workplaces, post offices, et cetera. You have reached the National Rifle Association. If you're calling about a school shooting, press one. If you're calling about a post office shooting, press two. If you're calling about any other workplace shooting, press three. Uh, Governor DeSantis in Florida, uh, one of his things was uh, fighting over with Disney because Disney was too uh, woke for him in terms of being tolerant of LGBTQ people. So here I have uh, uh, Mickey Mouse showing off my rant, Ron DeSantis watch. When uh, King Charles had his inauguration, I uh, couldn't help but think how Trump would be viewing it. I had larger crowds at my first coronation. Uh, June was uh, Pride Month for LGBTQ and the um, intolerant people on the right, uh, of course, had to find some way of uh, uh, showing their, their unhappiness with that. That's disgusting, right where children can see it. Uh, one of the um, unfortunate uh, Things that happened last year was the smoke from the Canadian wildfires crossing the border into our country. Um, I wish I could quit smoking, gasp. I'm up to 400 Canadian wildfires a day. Uh, Trump, uh, in his defense for his many misdeeds, uh, often says witch hunt, and I have uh, Lady Justice saying witch hunt.
this is another one, a dig at uh, people who want to uh, restrict what we read and, and learn and so on and so forth. He's already reading at a sixth grade level. Uh, this one is also on artificial intelligence. And the reason it's in black and white is for my negligence, I forgot to save the color version. So you just get to see it in black and white. Some tech revolution this is, they insist on working from home at least three days a week. Uh, sometimes I like to combine uh, a couple of uh, news events into one cartoon if I can uh, find a way of doing that. So uh, during uh, uh, some of the weather that we had uh, this past year, I managed to uh, pull that off. Mm -hmm. Hollywood writers and actors are on strike, but the special effects crew is working overtime. Uh, Trump, of course, uh, became the first uh, president to be indicted. Um, and uh, knowing Trump, of course, he made that into a uh, money raising opportunity. This indictment, what are the charges? Visa, MasterCard, American Express. Uh, I've been in New Jersey over 30 years and I still can't understand the pride some people take in us being the only state where you cannot pump your own gas. So um, uh, this is a dig at that. Uh, the first bumper sticker says, Jersey girls don't pump gas. And the second one says, Jersey girls don't charge their own EV. Uh, Trump is uh, well known for the quote that he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and not lose any votes. So when he first uh, got indicted and uh, I figured he'd you know, want to do anything to make things easier for him, I'm asking the trial judge for this change of venue. This um, affects a lot of people, but you know, New Jersey being a big pharmaceutical state, you know, it, it kind of goes both state and national. We can't let Medicare negotiate drug prices. We need the money to develop new cures, which we can't afford either. Uh, this cartoon was done as part of a campaign uh, among the news media when Trump was president. Uh, he had uh, done a lot of damage to uh, confidence in the news media and, uh, you know, calling the fake news and among other things. So uh, this was one of the few times that I actually uh, participated in um, one of these things where some organization says to the cartoonist, can you draw a cartoon on X topic? Usually I don't like to be told what to draw a cartoon on at any particular day, but because I felt strongly about it, I uh, agreed to do it. Now, I generally prefer to draw cartoons that are satirical or funny or biting or snarky or something. So when I have to, draw a cartoon that's like more inspirational or uplifting or positive. It's very hard for me and I, and I kind of sweat a lot. How, how can I do that without, you know, being on a maudlin or trite or, or whatever. So uh, this was a cartoon I, I did. Um, and I guess I was very lucky because uh, it got a lot of uh, positive response. And um, one of the things that happened was uh, about a year after that, um, 
there's a cartoon museum in uh, Ohio State, Columbus, that uh, mounted an exhibit of uh, cartoonists speaking out on the First Amendment. And they chose um, this cartoon as the uh, main promotional cartoon for the exhibit. And I'll, I'll show that. Uh, let me get down here. You can see that that's that's blown up. And in addition to being very flattered that they chose the cartoon, next to the um, image of the cartoon, there's a, a brief essay by Floyd Abrams. Floyd Abrams is a noted First Amendment lawyer who uh, won the uh, Pentagon Papers case uh, for the New York Times <laughs> in, in the Supreme Court in, in the early 70s. But he's like a hero for people who yeah. are yeah. passionate about First Amendment. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to go back to... I don't think he knows. All right. Thank you. This is, uh, I guess, the oldest cartoon. When uh, Clinton finally owned well, he's up... A to, uh, like he's not going around in the White House and made a so-called apology. Uh, this is a cartoon I drew. No, it's it's a temple thing. He did it two years ago. Too. Okay, um, when when Trump got his uh, mugshot taken what? in Georgia, and and they asked him to tell you know certain personal details, uh, one of the things that uh, stood out was his claiming that he weighed 215 pounds. So I figured, well, you know, how is Biden going to look at that? And he says, Trump, 215 pounds? That's the most ridiculous thing in all my 39 years. This uh, is an early uh, cartoon of Trump from before the election in 2016. This was back before Twitter became X. This uh, is a cartoon I did after 9-11. And this is another instance of where I wanted to do something more uplifting and inspirational because of the tone of the time. So this um, ran the Sunday after 9-11 and the record and this, of all the cartoons I did post 9-11, got the best response, uh, including um, uh, being asked to use it in a book from the Chicken Soup for the Soul series uh, called Chicken Soup for the Soul of America, which was based on people's essays or, or personal observations or, or feelings about 9-11. Uh, this was on uh, our, our esteemed Senator Menendez. I swear on a stack of gift Bibles, I did nothing illegal. You can just count that little bit. Um... Lights one see better. Okay, I had suggested that to Bob, and he said no because people on Zoom wouldn't be able to see me. But we'll make everybody up. okay, <laughs> all right, that's good. Okay, so uh, the issue of providing uh, aid to Ukraine has been uh, ongoing on Capitol Hill, uh, and I have uh, Uncle Sam talking to Zelensky. They aren't big on preserving our democracy either. Uh, here's another one. Um, New York is finally doing something about them.
This is uh, one done uh, shortly after October 7th. Doctor, will you prescribe something to help me sleep? Join Israel's security team. This was done when um, Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, if you're anywhere near my age, you may remember that there was a famous poster of Bob Dylan with the psychedelic hair that came with a record album, if you remember what those are, and which I had on my college wall. So, um, and this happens sometimes where two cartoonists or more working independently hit upon the same idea. So a friend of mine actually drew the identical cartoon and, and it just happened that way. Bright minds think alike. Congratulations, Dad. It's twins. This is one of the numerous cartoons I've done about uh, Congress and its uh, toadiness to the gun lobby. Uh, after several reports of Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito uh, accepting gifts and money from people with business before the Supreme Court, they said that they were going to come out with an ethics code. Justice Thomas here with our incredible new ethics code. Order it today. Dial the number on your screen. Operators are standing by. You lost Poland, France, Belgium, Czechoslovakia, but you still have Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and X. Here's an, another one. Uh, artificial intelligence is a very good source of uh, uh, cartoon material. They say we're setting loose deep fakes and misinformation. We had nothing to do with those two. Here's another one on the gun lobby. In case of mass shootings, we shelter in place. Is this a masterclass in tap dancing? Yes, a college president discussing anti-Semitism. And that was it for the cartoon. So uh, if you are so inclined, you can follow my cartoons at politicalcartoons.com or comicskingdom.com. And I have a website, but the, my website does not update the cartoons. And you can also just Google my name and you get the, all the hits for Juliana Margulies. You can find my name and see some of my cartoons. And now I would be glad to uh, take questions from Zoom or audience. Thank you very much, Jim. I'm back here. Um, so there are a few questions that have already been posed. So we're going to try to take them one at a time. OK. Uh, one of the first questions is, how did you decide uh, to become a political cartoonist? Okay, the question is, how did I decide to become a political cartoonist? Okay. Okay. The, the question is, how did I decide to become a political cartoonist? I um, found that I really enjoyed uh, political satire, starting as, as young as I was able to understand it. And um, one of the ways that I first became exposed to satire was through playing the guitar and what were called protest songs uh, about civil rights and, and the Vietnam War. And 
somewhere along the way in college, it dawned on me that because I was uh, studying art, that uh, if I could, you know, do something with political satire on my own, uh, that would be a very nice way to make a living. So I basically tried doing it, found that I had some aptitude towards it and enjoyed it. And that was it. I haven't stopped since. Next question. Okay. Um, the, uh, the cartoons that you draw, how do you decide which ones to draw? And I think you talked about this earlier, but have you ever gotten pressure to draw a particular cartoon about any subject? Um, how do I decide which cartoons to draw? I'll, I'll break that down into two questions. Uh, basically, I you follow the news, you know, really carefully, and I try to see which topics are well known enough that uh, people are familiar with it or talking about it or so on and so forth, and ones that I have an opinion on or feel so I can offer some kind of uh, insight on. So that that's the answer to that. As far as being pressured, um, well, right now, because I'm basically my own boss and editor, I don't have that uh, situation. When I worked at newspapers where I did have to answer to someone, uh, they they didn't really tell me, you know, what topics to draw cartoons about. They they had uh, editorial say over what was published, but it basically was my offering them five or six different options. I would make rough sketches and, and they would pick one and, and that would be it. So it, there was not really a situation of anyone above me pressuring me. Uh, one of the next questions is, have you ever met any of the figures you skewered and uh, reaction been something that you would like to share? Um, I have met um, a few people, but probably before I skewered them, uh, I when I first joined the record in 1990, we had an editorial uh, board meeting with then Governor Jim Florio, who, who was you know, very nice and asked me about myself. And turns out he and I both went to the same elementary school in Brooklyn. Um, uh, I'm trying to think which other, not not a lot. I I was I was um, happened to be on a flight. Uh, to the West Coast on my way to China and also on the flight was uh, the very controversial um, James Watt, who was the EPA administrator on the first George Bush. And once I saw he was on the plane, I quickly drew a, 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 a satirical cartoon of him and asked the stewardess to give it to him. And he came over and sat down next to me. And he said, you rascal. He was, he was, you know, very good natured about it. Um, but other than that, I can't think of many people in person that I've met. There's a question about the actual process of drawing your cartoons. Do you hand draw it? Do you use computers? How do you? I, I basically hand draw it. I, I do a pencil drawing on tracing paper, which I, I taped down on a, uh, a light box, which is basically the, the size of a very big iPad. And then I, I put a, a piece of uh, illustration board over that and, and the light shines through and I trace over it with ink and, and marker. Once I've done that, then I, I scan it um, into Photoshop and edit it so that it fits the uh, dimensions that the syndicate requires. And that's how that works. 
is there any topic that you avoid because you feel either personally uh, you could feel threatened or it's too hot or do you feel like hey i'm the cartoonist and i i've got that freedom to explore any topic? um I, um i guess right now with what's going on in israel i haven't done as many cartoons as as some of my uh, contemporaries because it's for me it's hard to narrow it down or to to make to simplify it to the point where you know i think one side is clearly you know uh all bad or all good or something like that so so i i've, I've done cartoons that are connected to it but not you know, commenting on some aspects of, of what's going on. Uh, there's a, a question about the New Yorker comics. So in general, are what, what comics, what cartoonists inspire you? Do you model yourself after that you admire? So, um, well, I, I did definitely uh, grow up looking at New Yorker cartoons because my parents subscribed to it. And even before I had any notion of uh, being a cartoonist myself, I always used to read the cartoons uh, in the New Yorker, and I I still really enjoy them very much. And and just as an aside, um, uh, Temple members may know that uh, the daughter of a uh, Temple member, Harriet Fink, uh, Leanna Fink, is one of those cartoonists whose uh, work appears quite frequently in the New Yorker. And she's I think she's really good. Uh, let's have a real question. When, when you caricature a uh, politician or a famous person, do you realize that do you uh, look at a photo, do you rely on the photo, or, or just your recollection of what the person looks like? Uh, definitely you, use. Please repeat the question that people on the screen. Okay, yeah. The, 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 the question is about when I caricature a uh, public official, uh, do I do it from memory or I, do I refer to a photo? Um, mostly, I refer to a photo. Uh, Google Images is, uh, you know, my resource. But with someone like Trump, who I've done numerous times, that I can do for memory. <laughs> well, that's kind of um, you obviously have to keep up with um, the political news globally. I was curious, what outlets do you use in terms of printed media and televised media to get your information from? Okay, the, the question is, what what um, news sources do I uh, rely upon? Um, I read the New York Times, uh, the print edition, well, and then at times also the online edition. I uh, try to watch the evening news. Um, and then there are other things, like if I go on one of these... Uh, sites that aggregate news from different sources like google news or the ap or things like that i i try to see what's going on so that uh, i know what's happening and and hopefully uh, events do not overtake what i'm uh, drawing about there's a question about your mentoring any young cartoonist coming up or teaching or anything like that with all your experience? Um, I did have a intern, I guess, in my first job uh, in, in the um, Washington, D.C. area. I worked for a chain of suburban newspapers in uh, Virginia and Maryland. And so one summer I had a, a young man who came and hung out in my office. Uh, I haven't done that since then, um, uh, once I taught a class at uh, adult ed at Nassau Community College a long time ago, but that's about it. Okay, Here's my question. Um, with the decreasing influence of newspapers, magazines, and broadcast television, and the increasing influence of multi-channel, unaccountable, often inaccurate media sources like X, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and the like. How does that, I think, affect one, your mission, and two, your distribution? Okay, the, the question is, with with the declining influence of 
uh, legacy media, newspapers, uh, uh, TV, and so on, and, and the increased influence of um, social media and, and unverified sources. Well, that 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 explains a real lot of what's wrong in this country. I think uh, where. Uh, uh, I, I think maybe this sounds very elitist, but uh, where people who don't have the experience or don't bother to fact check have the same ability to spread the word as uh, people who are trained journalists and 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 have the integrity of you know making sure that what they're saying is factual and so on and so forth. As far as how it affects me as a cartoonist. Well, the uh, environment for cartoonists is very difficult. It was, it was always a tough thing to get into, but because there are, uh, you know, newspapers are not doing well and newspapers were the main source of employment, the number of uh, jobs for staff cartoonists has decreased so that maybe 20 years ago, there may have been 100 uh, cartoonists at newspapers around the country. Now it's fewer than 30. Most most cartoonists now are in my situation where they're basically on their own working for a syndicate and, and so on and so forth. And you know, some of those newspapers are relying you know, exclusively on syndicated cartoonists rather than having their own cartoonist on staff. There's also a question about how your frequency of cartoons, what, what's now your 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 general pace? At which okay, the question is how many cartoons do I do? Uh, I do five cartoons a week, Monday through Friday for King Features, uh, that, that's a national syndication. I also do about two a week, for the New Jersey papers that I deal with on my own. What about the influence of artificial intelligence, AI? I mean, there's a question, can you ever be replaced? I think that would be impossible, but how how do you see AI as maybe enhancing your work or changing what you do? Well, th there's a threat of, of it being, you know, something being lifted from, you know, my work or, any other artist and and change in a way that you know is, is perhaps opposite of of the intent you know that the original creator uh, has done. So that's definitely a threat. Now that even before we ever heard of artificial intelligence, that was being done at times where some individual or some group would help themselves to someone's cartoon and change a few labels or, or do whatever. And it, it's, you know, it would be hard to, to police it unless there's some, you know, enforcement or ability to, to wipe it out. I don't know what's going to happen. Isn't that copyright infringement? Uh, yeah. But... <laughs> right. But, um, you know, I, 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 I don't have the ability to go after them and, you know. I understand. But it is only. Oh, yeah. So there's a question about Trump's carpure. If it's it changed over time, but in general, no. that's a great question. But I guess you're trying to capture a, a story, a theme with this a specific image. So I guess. You know, I, I guess that process is, is a better uh, question to ask. How do you do that? How do you decide what is going to capture a, a story or a part? Uh, I'm not exactly sure where the coiffure. The coiffure well, I guess that's to capture Trump, Donald Trump, whatever. So I, I, that that's your way of signifying Trump, I guess. Or or you could do that with a number of different uh, themes, a number of different. Uh, well, well, basically anything that uh, you know is uh, a characteristic of an individual you use to exaggerate or ridicule, and you know some some people like 
him have, have like a big target painted on them saying, make fun of me, you know? I mean, you know, he, he's like, if, if he wasn't for real, you'd have to create him and, you know, say, what's the most ridiculous looking thing you could do and walk around in public? All right. As to, uh, do you worry about factual information as you create your cartoon? Do I worry about it? Well, I, I I try to make sure that my cartoons are based upon a defensible interpretation of um, you know the events as I see them. So I, I'm I'm not going to make something up totally out of uh, the air. I, it has to have some connection or some uh, you know a tie-in to to something and hope that, you know, given the uh, ability to satirize in this country, that people will accept that. Okay. Last question. Has there ever been a cartoon that you've regretted for whatever reason, for the impact, I guess, or work on something? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, uh, finding out certain things uh, after the cartoon was published. Now, uh, I guess sometime after 9-11, there was concern about uh, Saddam Hussein, who was then the dictator of Iraq, developing nuclear weapons. So I, you know, thought that that was a legitimate concern. And then that unfortunately became the, the, um, uh, alibi for the U.S. going into Iraq with the weapons of mass destruction. But anyway, I, at some point, I thought that that was a legitimate thing that there, there, there was uh, he was developing uh, nuclear weapons, and, and I did a cartoon about that. And not only did I come to regret it, but it it it, it was used on. I think the New York State Regents exam. So it's like I, it's not. It's like you know, if, if you have something bad on the internet, you try to scrub it off. Well, I couldn't do that. This is you know, it's like being tattooed on something on mass. So you know, I, normally I would have been happy and flattered to hear that something like that used my cartoon, but not with that one, Bob. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think we're, we're we're about ready. All right. Well, Jimmy, thank thank you for a wonderful presentation. Very much appreciated. Very entertaining. Very interesting. We can do a little round of applause there, either by show of hands or some other way. That Jimmy can get an expression of your appreciation as well. Uh, we are delighted that you were able to share this, and uh, we have this special behind the scenes of uh, someone who does something that you would not normally know about, and you provide for us. Uh, a special education that really was wonderful. So thank you very much for taking the time tonight. Thank everyone for joining us on this participation um, in our programming. And uh, I'm going to stop the programming now so that we can just do. Uh, um, do, do you want to talk about our next speaker, Lawrence? Oh, certainly. I wanted just to mention to everyone that this coming Sunday at 930, Lawrence Fine, Rabbi Fine's and Olive Fine's son, just came back from Cuba from a semester abroad. And he'll be sharing his experience of how a Jewish boy goes to school in Cuba, how that all really happens. So you're welcome, 930 live and in person uh, and live stream to view him. This live Sunday. stream? And live, live stream as well. Yes, he will be on live stream. So you can tune into the Temple Israel program channel there. And then the following week, his father begins his uh, adult education program. Uh, Rabbi Fine begins that on Hannah Arendt. So those are programs coming up. And long term, February 22nd, Alan Sanders will be with us and we'll be talking about the um, volatile political world we're in. And we'll get some deeper insight as Alan uh, really digs into that for us and our audience together. That will certainly be a participatory program. So let me just stop our recording and say thank you, everyone.